All right. All right, so welcome fellow fellows. Welcome to my presentation. I know, it's whatever. Oh, have you instead of chess today? Oh, yes, I, this has been since. <laughs> this presentation was made in February in anticipation of my March talk about targeted temperature management. And then obviously coronavirus happened. So it got delayed until two weeks ago and then I got delayed again because I was on nights. So we are gonna talk about targeted temperature management or cooling patients. We do it a lot now. Okay, so why do we cool someone? So the concern is for people with prolonged cardiac, cardiac arrest. So longer than 30 minutes. That uh, is a, some assumed to have a poor prognosis. Less than half uh, actually survived a discharge, less than, or, and then a third have persistent neurological deficits, and then less than a half uh, returned to pre-arrest function, except the patient that I have who is now ANO times four after 16 rounds of epi. Good for him. Um, duration of ischemia uh, also um, is the critical determinant of the brain damage, and your first goal is always to obtain early reperfusion, which is why we do CPR. Um, there's a concern for reperfusion injury and post ischemic neuro, uh, neurological death is often delayed by hours to days. And that is where targeted temperature management may be able to be helpful because it may be able to improve neurological incomes in that possible therapeutic window, given the fact that it may happen hours to days later. Um, and so the pathophysiology of brain ischemia, you can have complete or incomplete brain ischemia, focal or global, transient or permanent. Now, um, in terms of a cardiac arrest, that would be an, a complete global, um, possibly transient uh, ischemia. And then the severity and duration of the ischemia determines the number and the types of cells at risk. The injury mechanisms um, essentially is what causes the depolarization of the uh, plasma membrane and the neurons. And in animal studies, they've uh, determined that it's when it falls below uh, 10 milliliters per 100 grams per minute. And then brief ischemia of only one to two minutes, essentially you're not gonna see any brain death or any type of uh, neurological issues. And then prolonged ischemia greater than 30 minutes is when you have neurological death uh, or neuronal death and then whether reperfusion occurs or not. So CPR is uh, essentially you have a complete global brain ischemia and then when you do CPR, it's an incomplete global ischemia because uh, cerebral blood flow during CPR is actually rarely adequate to maintain um, the membrane polarization. So that happens within one to two minutes of cardiac arrest. And then uh, patients rarely survive sudden cardiac arrest, it's less than 10%. Um, so there's a post-cardiac arrest syndrome that involves brain injury, myocardial depression, reperfusion injury, and then ongoing injury from the precipitating cause of the arrest, so PE or whatever it was. Um, so, in terms of the neuronal injury, these are the mechanisms of that injury. That in, involves altered calcium hemostasis, free radical formation, which is what we are always concerned about with reperfusion injury. There's gonna be mitochondrial dysfunction, protease activation, and inflammation, which is another thing why we use cooling to try and prevent inflammation. Um, all of these pathways can occur in sequence or in parallel, and they all crosstalk. And then there's a huge variability because of the heterogeneity of the patient population between the time course and the relative contribution of all of these different pathways, which then leads to neuronal cell death. Um, so our goal of targeted temperature management is to reduce the cerebral oxygen consumption, reduce the free radical formation, reduce the myocondrial dysfunction, reduce the proteus activation, and uh, reduce inflammation and the fevers, all in the hopes that we can improve the neurological outcomes and get more people to survive to discharge and have uh, less neuronal injury. All right, so the initial trials, these were actually done in 2002. Both of these first initial trials were published in the same um, journal volume. Um, it was all in February in uh, New England Journal of Medicine. So this one was mild therapeutic hypothermia. Um, this was a cardiac arrest after V-fib arrest. They, uh, cooled the patient to 32 to 34 degrees Celsius versus the standard treatment of normal thermia. They had 275 patients, about evenly split. Uh, they reached their targeted temperature within eight hours, as you can see here. Um, so usually around 34, they'll get around eight hours. 
and then they had passive rewarming up to a temperature above 36 and that took anywhere between 8 to 12 hours. Um, they had a favorable neurologic income, uh, outcome as well as a favorable risk of death um, and the number needed to treat was six and seven. And so this was one of the landmark studies that uh, essentially brought on targeted temperature management. The next study, oh, and this is the other stuff, so p-values here, and then your cumulative survival with hypothermia versus normal thermia, so you obviously see the significant difference. And if you want to see the baseline characteristics, follow up. They're very evenly matched. Complications, uh, there weren't any big differences between um, sepsis, renal failure, hemodialysis between the two sources. And then um, this is a cerebral performance score. So one to two uh, indicates better performance scores. Three to four, you're comatose or have severe neurological deficits. So the goal is to always, if you uh, discharge out of the hospital, uh, is, the goal is to have a CPC score of one to two. Um, this was a second trial. This was done in Australia, um, in Melbourne, it, with one EMS uh, group in the city. Um, and this was for the treatment of comatose survivors of out of hospital cardiac arrest with induced hypothermia. Um, so in this case, essentially the same type of stuff was done. They did uh, notice that aspirin was given to all these patients. Um, there was about 50, uh, 40 patients per side. So hypothermia was 43 and the no was 34. Um, all the patients also were admitted with PA catheters. Um, and so they actually started the basic cooling measures in the ambulance. They would do uh, cold normal saline and start it in the, um, in the ambulance and then bring them trying to be, maintain that coolness all the way to the hospital through the ICU. Um, so they began active rewarming at hour 18. And then um, how was that? Um, essentially 50% of those patients were considered to have a good neurological outcome. They were discharged home or rehab. In this study, they actually didn't talk about the uh, cerebral performance scores. Um, the concerns were that every two years uh, increase in age, they had a 9% decrease in the likelihood of a good outcome. And then every 1.5 minutes of arrest to ROSC, they also had a decreased likelihood of a good outcome. And your difference in mortality did not reach a statistical significance. Um, so one of the biggest portions, so those were the two initial studies. That's why we started doing um, targeted temperature management. Uh, apparently it was started in 2002, but I don't, we just started doing it here for most patients, I don't know, 15 years later. So um, one of the biggest issues with targeted temperature management and cooling a patient is the patient will shiver. And so that will actually increase their resting uh, energy expenditure um, and uh, oxygen consumption. Um, and this would essentially offset the benefits that we would suspect in targeted temperature management in terms of the um, fevers and the inflammation and the uh, reducing the oxygen consumption of the brain. So bef before they did this bedside shivering assessment scale, there was no standardized assessment tool for clinicians to assess shivering. And so this uh, BSAS scale was um, investigated and then validated. It's a four point scale. Um, it was two physicians and two RNs that independently assessed uh, patients in terms of what they assumed their shivering to be and what they would rate it. And then they also assessed it by indirect, oh, I can't say that word, calamitry. Um, and then all raters were blinded to each other. And the majority of the score was accepted. And in, in this study for the BSAS, most of the patients actually had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, when they were doing targeted temperature management and the shivering. There was high intra-rater reliability and there was perfect agreement uh, with 86% of the instances. So it was strongly associated with, and I'll show you on the next slide, uh, resting energy expenditure, O2 consumption, CO2 production, and hypermetabolic index. So it's all here. So essentially, the higher the score, the more they would consume oxygen, the more that they would have their, they would shiver and essentially their resting energy expenditure would be elevated, offsetting the benefits, of, the suspected benefits of targeted temperature management. All right. So as we continue on many years down the road, so about 10 years later, um, 
target temperature management has been the standard of care. And the thought was, do, do we need to actually cool patients down to 33 degrees Celsius versus 36 degrees Celsius after cardiac arrest? Now, the recommendation that, and the reason why 32 to 33 degrees Celsius was uh, chosen back in the day was because it was extrapolated from animal models and previous studies. Um, now, do, and we talk about this now, do we actually need to cool them to that level or do we just need to prevent the fevers from happening? And if you looked at in the first study, they would cool the patient and then have passive rewarming and the, or they would just rewarm or just be the same standard of care that they had previous to 2002. And you would see actually in that study that people were actually at 38 degrees Celsius for quite a while. So that is something that we're trying to prevent. So in this randomized controlled uh, trial, there was 36 ICUs in Australia and Europe. Uh, it was uh, assigned one-to-one -one with a uh, targeted body temperature of... Uh, 33 degrees Celsius to 36 degrees Celsius. They maintained sedation for 36 hours and they tried to achieve their temperature as rapidly as possible instead of just trying to get there within eight hours as the first study tried to do. Um, there's many devices, and I'll talk about that in a second, as to what those devices are to cool a patient. After 28 hours, they rewarmed the patient gradually, uh, and they did it by active rewarming, um, by doing it by 0 0.5 Celsius uh, degrees per hour. Um, and the goal was to maintain the body temperature of an unconscious patient below 37.5 degrees Celsius until 72 hours post-arrest. And again, this is to prevent that uh, fever from going, inflammation from occurring, um, and increasing that O2 consumption and uh, resting energy expenditure. So in this study, these are some of the other stuff. So if you wanted to see the demographics between the two, they were very evenly matched. Um, essentially, there was no difference, as you can see, between the survivals of the 36 degrees and 33 degrees Celsius. This is just the range of temperatures that they had. And then as they warmed up, same thing. So it was just essentially to maintain no fevers with the, the 36 group. Um, there was really no difference in the primary outcomes, nor in the deaths or the neurological function of the patients. Um, there was, uh, in this, uh, some hypokalemia at 33 degrees Celsius, and that's sort of to be understandable that if we have hypothermic patients, they are going to be hypokalemic, and then as you rewarm them, their potassium would shift out into the extravascular um, or intravascular component. Um, and there was no harm noted at 33 degrees Celsius compared to 36. All right, so initially the first uh, criteria was that you had to have a, um, a shockable out of cardiac arrest. That was the first indication for targeted temperature management. Then we started having expansions of that criteria. Um, and in 2015, it was for an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest with an additional shockable rhythm. They also recommended out-of-hospital cardiac arrest with non-shockable rhythms and an in-hospital in cardiac arrest with any rhythm. They have to remain unresponsive after ROSC. Uh, the duration of the targeted temperature management for, should be at least for 24 hours. You select and maintain a temperature of what you want between 33 and 36, 32 or 36. Um, but there's technically no difference between those in terms of um, mortality benefit or um, issues, except in really hypokalemia and electrolyte issues, you will see more of that at the lower temperature that you choose. Um, and they actually, in 2015, the International Liaison and Committee of Resuscitation recommended against the use of pre-hospital cooling with rapid infusions of large volume cold IVF. All right, so this was a ret retrospective cohort study. Now we're going into like now times 2016 and later. Um, so it's just a cohort study. And this was uh, investigating people for therapeutic hypothermia and survival after in, in hospital cardiac arrest. So again, this is the expansion of the criteria from what it was initially in 2002. So they did it with adjustments with propensity scores. Um, I'm not the best at this type of registry type of study, but um, essentially they saw that it was actually targeted temperature management was associated with worse outcomes in hospital survival if you gave it to people with in-hospital cardiac arrest. So 
From the randomized control trials to this type of registry cohort study, you're going to need a randomized control trial to really assess the F efficacy of targeted temperature management in, in, in hospital cardiac arrest, but we still use it, even though this data was suggestive of that it would have worse outcomes. Um, and this, like, they had 11, like, over 100,000 people that they had in the registry, and then it brought it all the way down to 1,500. And they compared the 1,500 to 3,700 non-hypothermic treated patients. Again, to me, I don't know. They need a randomized control trial. All right. And then another question was essentially, do you need to cool them for 24, or would 48 hours be better and beneficial to a patient? Um, this was done in 2017 in JAMA. Um, they had, uh, this was done in 10 ICUs in six European countries, and they randomized 355 patients and 351 completed the trial. They followed them for six months. They followed for neurologic outcomes as well as mortality. There was no significant difference in the neurological outcomes, although the, the thought was that they trended towards the 48-hour mark. No difference in mortality. And there were more adverse uh, events in the 48 hour, which makes sense as they try to cool and maintain that. And there was also a longer uh, median ICU stay in the 48 hour group, again, because they have to stay at least an extra day um, because you're cooling them for 48 hours. And so here you see that there's really no difference. You see that there's a prolongation of the targeted temperature management and then they go back up um, to the same temperature as before. And there's no difference in terms of really the mortality. Um, and then any adverse event was what was found to be worse. <laughs> and then as we continue on, uh, targeted temperature management with uh, cardiac arrest and non shock bulb rhythms. This was done in New England Journal of Medicine in 2019. Um, and this was from an outside hospital or in in hospital cardiac arrest. And it was just to expand the criteria to see if it would work for non shockable rhythms. Again, like many of these studies, shows no difference in mortality. <laughs> um, and then this is the distribution of the uh, performance scores, one through five, one and two being better scores than um, three, four, and five. really no difference in terms of their performance scores or their death rates. All right, so in terms of our Henry Ford Hospital protocol, I'm just going to talk about the entire protocol in and of itself. So they do utilize a lot of these uh, studies as part of their evidence to use in the protocol. So our inclusion criteria includes anyone that's uh, age 15 and above. They had either an inpatient or out of hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, regardless of the arrest ideology, and they have to have ROSC. They also have to have essentially a GCS of less than eight. So they have to be comatose after ROSC. Um, exclusion criteria, if they're awake following commands. So if they can follow you, do not cool them, please. Please. Um, if they're DNR, don't know how you achieved ROSC when they're DNR, but good on you. Magician. Um, if. <laughs> If they had ROSC after eight hours, um, if they're known coagul uh, coagulopathy because cooling and especially cooling to lower temperatures, you're, the risk is that you would worsen uh, their coagulopathy. If they had any type of traumatic hemorrhagic arrest, so technically there is a caveat to this regardless of arrest etiology. There is one that you should not do, again, if they were hemorrhagic shock. And then if their uh, temperature was below 30 degrees Celsius, and if they had any existing medical condition, metastatic uh, cancer, or if they were in hospice. I would hope that they were, if they were in hospice, that they were not also full code. But we also have those interesting times. Now I put these pictures on uh, to show you the different types of uh, probes that we can use to follow the temperature. So this is the, the Foley with the temperature probe right here. Um, so sometimes you'll see this like weird thing and you'll be like, what is that? That's the temperature probe on the Foley. And this is the esophageal probe. Um, targeted temperature management is supposed to be initiated ASAP, as soon as possible, whether they're in the ER, the ICU, 
technically says regardless of patient location, but if they're in the hallway, I probably wouldn't start there. Um, patients with acute MIs, um, and if they need any type of hemodynamic support devices, that's going to coordinate with cardiology, and they would be sent, obviously, to the cardiac ICU for those type of assist devices. Uh, you can use external or internal cooling methods. If you do use a cooling catheter, you can't use it with a heparin allergy, and you shouldn't have a uh, and you shouldn't use the cooling catheters if they have IVC filters, because the concern is that you're gonna essentially freeze a part of it and have it break off. Um, mannitol should not be used through the cooling catheters. And if they have any refractory arrhythmias, bradycardias, or thrombocytopenias, that you would need to consider uh, stopping the uh, targeted temperature management. Um, and again, they do require a device to uh, monitor the uh, temperature, again, Foley or esophageal monitor. Most of us will probably order the Foley. Um, and if you do use the esophageal probe, you do need a chest x-ray to confirm the placement. Our arterial line must be placed in all targeted temperature management patients for hemodynamic monitoring and blood sampling. We cannot use uh, essentially uh, pulse oxes when they're targeted temperature management. You need to go off of the gases. Um, so you, initially, you need to decide on what temperature you want to set. Now we have that there's no difference between 33 and 36, and you may have slightly more adverse events at 33, especially with hypokalemia, possibly more coagulopathy, stuff like that. So I routinely will choose 36 at this point um, to uh, cool the patient down. Because again, the thought is that if you're at least reducing the chance of their or incre their increased oxygen consumption, you're reducing that inflammation, you're reducing um, their resting energy expenditure, then 36 and at least maintaining no fevers would be able to help that. Um, and then you're supposed to maintain their that targeted temperature for four hour, or 24 hours. Uh, you want to reach that temperature within four hours of initiation of targeted temperature management. And again, you want you have to decide to initiate it within eight hours of their ROSC. Okay. Um, other goals, you want to keep their MAP above 65. That, um, oh, sorry, there's a typo there. Um, if you want to use any neuromuscular blockades, if they're shivering to an extent, um, you try not to do it until obviously they're have, achieving a RAS of negative four, negative five. And usually you do not need um, like Nimbex or something, but sometimes you do. Um, and at one point you can also think about sometimes people have a higher uh, shivering threshold. So if you can reduce their temperature below that, they will stop shivering sometimes on their own. Um, you don't need to use neuromuscular blockade. So if they're shivering at 36, they may not actually shiver at 34 um, is the thought because you may be under their sh uh, shivering threshold. Um, and so again, like I said, the pulse ox is gonna be inaccurate during targeted temperature management. So you should use ABGs for their uh, oxygen saturations. Uh, you need to, uh, per the policy, have to obtain an ABG and lactate at the onset. And then once they reach their targeted temperature, you have to repeat it again. Um, you cannot have any replacement protocols on for electrolytes. This is because as you cool the patient, the patient will definitely become hypokalemic. And then as you rewarm them, the, the potassium that was pushed intracellularly by translocation will then go uh, intra, intravascularly, and then their potassium you're, would have been more aggressive, and then they'll be hyperkalemic by the time you rewarm them. Only use A-lines for glucose checks. It's the same thing essentially as a pulse ox. Essentially, there's lower blood flow rate in your fingertips as you cool a patient. So um, if you check the sugar there, it's going to be probably falsely low. So I would just do it as an A-line. And then, as I talked about, hypothermia causes hypokalemia. Your goal potassium when they're cold is 3.5. Leave it there. So don't be too aggressive. Don't go for four. Um, try and just keep it at 3.5. And then be conservative when treating hypokalemia during the rewarming period. And then you're, if you have a low magnesium, I would actually replace the magnesium because that actually would help with shivering. So your goal is actually to have a hyper mag level of 2.5 to 3. Um, this is all in the policy, by the way. Uh, for coagulopathy, you want to make sure that the patient is not on any type of IV heparin unless you have a confirmed DVT, PE, or they need uh, an assist device. If they have all of those things and you need heparin for that, then that's okay for the policy. But otherwise, you would take it all off. Um, you would not feed the patient during targeted temperature management. The patient is supposed to be MPO, and you're actually supposed to place the NG tube to low intermittent suction. And then once you, you can restart once they're rewarmed and you can hear bowel sounds. If you can't hear bowel sounds, you're not supposed to start yet. 
And in the vent circuit, you have to talk to the respiratory therapist because uh, they usually have the heated humidifier on it as well. That should be turned off for at least the 24 hours of the initiation and maintenance of targeted temperature management. And then talking about the shivering in the policy. So if you choose 35 or 36 as a targeted temperature, consider choosing a lower temperature to get under that uh, shivering threshold um, because shivering will worsen and, uh, and decrease the effectiveness of your targeted temperature management. And then what you actually also do is put a warming blanket on. I know that sounds contraintuitive, but you actually put a warming blanket on to control the um, essentially shivering on the periphery and then centrally they would be more cold. So all targeted temperature management patients actually have to have a warming blanket on. Sounds counterintuitive. And then you evaluate, well the nurse will evaluate every 15 minutes with, I know you guys aren't, don't worry about it, you guys are busy. Um, the nurse will evaluate every 15 minutes with a BSAS score and then hourly once the targeted uh, BSAS assessment is reached. If you still have shivering, uh, Tylenol, analgesics, sedatives, so that's fentanyl, propofol, and then your last step would be neuromuscular black, uh, blockade. Um, and then if you use propofol, please do not do a sedation vacation during targeted temperature management, please. And then if you still have hypotension with propofol, the plant, uh, per the policy, it, was, it would ask you to use a set rate of Versed. All right, so when you're rewarming a patient per the policy, stop the NIMBEX. I think we would all assume that that would be something that we would do initially, but per the policy, just stop it at the beginning of it. And then you should rewarm them um, 0 0.25 uh, degrees Celsius per hour to a goal temp of 37. The goal is not to rewarm them and then just have them rewarm to whatever they want to rewarm to. The goal is to get them to 37 and maintain them at 37. So you, sometimes you actually do actively still rewarm them, but keep them at that temperature for a lot longer. Um, once they do reach 36, if your goal, uh, since the goal tub is 37, or if you were at 36 and going up to 37, you can di uh, discontinue the sedation and the pad protocol can be restarted and you can restart your electrolyte replacement protocol unless the patient has an AKI. Please don't start it when a patient has AKIs. Um, and then you need to leave all the devices on. And then for another 24 hours after they reach 37, you maintain them at 37 degrees Celsius. If they have no uh, fevers present during that rewarming phase, then you can start removing the cooling devices. And then if fevers were present, then you want to maintain that. Uh, usually it's the Arctic sun that we use here now um, to use that uh, and maintain that temperature 37 degrees Celsius. Um, any type of prognosis or withdrawal of care should not be enacted during the cooling, maintenance, or rewarming phases. And then uh, brain death determinations or withdrawal of cares should be delayed until 72 hours post-arrest in the cardiac arrest TTM patients. Those are my references. I didn't pass out. God. Okay. 30-minute talk. Anybody have questions? <laughs> Wait, how do I do that? Oh, QA. In so it I guess it depends on which trial we're talking about. Um in terms of the first two, um, the thought was that, if I remember correctly, that they were not actually cooled and they were excluded from the trial. Um, if we're talking about targeted temperature management at 33 to 36, uh, they were also excluded from that trial if they were brought in cold. Um, The other ones I'm not as familiar with. Where's the more? Okay. Chat. From Dr. J. Prakash. We are a site for NIH ice caps trial adaptive response looking at different targeted temperature management and goals. 
very cool. If you guys want to be a part of a study, Dr. Shavarkash seems to be running it. Oh, click on the two participant raise hand. Wait, where's that? Yeah, click Okay. Dr. Rivers and Dr. Roulette, you're both unmuted. I think. <laughs> Oh, how do I? But I think it's from there. They have to unmute when they're ready to go. Oh. Hi, this is Dan Ouellette. Can you hear me? Yes, no. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. Um, I wonder if I can just end. Oh, I guess I probably should end it. Hi, Dan Ouellette here. Can you hear me? Dr. Ouellette, we're having a hard time hearing you. I'm just going to try and turn up the volume. Give us just a second. Go ahead, Dr. Ouellette. Let's see if this works. Okay. Can you hear me now? We, I can hear you just barely, barely but yes. You presented a nice review of our protocol. You presented one article that was a review study, a retrospective study with over a thousand patients looking at in-hospital cardiac arrest and the use of targeted temperature management. And you that study demonstrates worse mortality and worse neurologic outcomes with targeted temperature management. My question for you is which patients in my MICU should I use targeted temperature management in since the only data that we seem to have, and I've looked uh, at some of the references or some of the, uh, some of the articles that have referenced that study, since the only data that we have suggests worse outcomes in patients who have in-hospital cardiac arrest. I mean, the, the patients that they had, because it was a registry data, I mean, I don't. It was a retrospective study with a propensity analysis to adjust for co-founders, and there was mm -hmm. over a thousand patients. So that's not, that's not terrible data. And, and so, I mean, it is true that because this was for in-hospital cardiac arrest, because of the propensity of the data showing that it was lower favorable neurological outcomes, there is a possibility that it may not end up, if once the randomized control trial is done, may actually benefit any patient. Um, the thought that it was used in uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest was that uh, as long as it was witnessed, you would know the downtime and everything that in that aspect. In hospital cardiac arrest, the, the assumption is that that's an immediate response to the patient and there wouldn't be that much of a downtime um, between uh, the initiation of CPR to essentially go to that um, transient global ischemia from complete global ischemia. And so there is the possibility that it may actually not benefit any patients. Uh, in terms of the patient population that we select here, um, per the policy, we can select and an really any patient to do it uh, but again, is it actually going to benefit them in the long run? Maybe, maybe not. Um, so if you have a patient in your ICU next week and they have an arrest in the, in the ICU and they don't, they're not conscious afterwards, are you going to use targeted temperature management based on the risks and benefits of the data that you know? Because of the low likelihood of recovery and favorable neurological outcomes in any kind of cardiac arrest type of patient, if this is the only type of treatment that may be beneficial or at least not harmful if we use targeted temperature management, I would choose it. And I actually did use it uh, two weeks ago on a patient that had an in-hospital in cardiac arrest. She actually did end up waking up, um, but unfortunately passed away from another cardiac arrest three days later. Um, so I, I does seem, at least in my limited experience here, um, to be at least somewhat beneficial. But obviously, I think we would just need 
on uh, more and more data and at least a, a blinded study to see if we would be able to uh, prove in fact that it yes or no helped patients with in-hospital cardiac arrest. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else, anyone?